So let's start with uh, Luke Wagner. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Luke Wagner here. I'm the Senior Specialist for Democracy and Governance at Commonics. Uh, I'm excited to be joining. Great, thanks, Luke. Yeah. Next person to my screen is Angela Canterbury. Hi, folks, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Hi, I'm Angela Canterbury. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications and Advocacy at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, Mouthful, um, or IFAS. And it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Thanks so much, Angela. Welcome. Next, uh, Andrea. Good morning, all. Uh, I'm trying to. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Good morning, all. My name is Andrea Liferoci. Uh, I am an associate director of the Democracy Program at the Carter Center, where I work with uh, Barbara. Glad to be here today. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Next, over to Derek. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Derek Mingerhoff. I'm uh, Emeritus Distinguished Fellow at RTI International. I'm the uh, former co-chair of this working group. Uh, I held that position for seven years before they put in place term limits. Uh, I'm currently co-chair of the DC-based community of practice on thinking and working politically. Thanks so much, Derek. And thanks for all the great work you did over that seven year period. Uh, Matthew, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Click. I'm the director of research and learning at Causal Design. We're actually a research and evaluation shop based in Denver, Colorado. Great, thanks, Matthew. And this is my first time joining, so nice meeting everyone. Uh, Irving. Let's go to, I'll go back to Irving. I'll, how about Lisa McGregor? Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa McGregor. I'm the Technical Director for Governance uh, for RTI. Good to see or meet uh, some of you. I may only be able to stay for the first hour. Um, so just a uh, heads up, I may have to sign off early, but thanks for organizing this. Great, thanks so much, Lisa. Okay, Irving, back to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I may be the oldest member of this group because I know I was involved in the creation of SID 50 years ago. Uh, I am a retired uh, minister counselor in USAID, where my specialty was government and public administration. And uh, I then was a professor at American University teaching it. And I've got a PhD in public administration and government from, from uh, American University. And uh, I know a lot of the people here, and uh, I may write a book one of these days. So I'm glad to be with you all and learn as much as I can about what happened since yesterday. Thanks so much, Irving. The last block I see is Lisa iPhone. Lisa McGregor, is that your second connection or is that a different individual? Yes, that's me. Um, just having two connections so that the sound is good. Thanks. No problem at all. So as everyone that's online so far, if anyone else joins, we'll be sure to give them an opportunity to chime in and introduce themselves. With that though, I will um, move into the kind of purpose of today, which is to set the work group agenda for the next 12 months. Um, and, I think Barbara is going to walk us through before we do that what the the purpose of the work group is. So we're all aware on the same page. Yeah, thanks. And so um, this will be a repeat for a lot of you who've participated or co-chaired or been very involved. But since we have a number of new folks, I'll just um, quickly um, reiterate sort of our objectives um, and mission. So of course, with Sid Washington, the idea here is to create this town hall. Uh, uh, sort of atmosphere for the development community through these working groups. And of course we have uh, working groups on various topics, including DRG. Um, they're chaired of course by the two co-chairs. Um, and then our, you know, our mandate is to 
to really focus on discussions around key development challenges and share best practices and innovation um, with this community. Uh, and then, so for DRG specifically, right, we're working on uh, informing and educating on development issues related to, to democracy rights and governance, as well as how civil society helps shape uh, economic and social outcomes and informs our, the, DR, the uh, DRG uh, work across the sector. So that's, that's just a quick summary, um, uh, just to sort of help us guide and our discussion as we're, as we're thinking through this, you know, thinking about innovation, best practices, and what are these key development challenges? Back over to Patrick. So that core mission in mind, the, the goal for today really is to agree on topics for two public events we'll organize for the next year. We want to make sure that those events are of interest and relevant for all of you, the constituents of your organizations, as well as folks coming in the new administration. So in advance of this meeting, many of you completed a survey asking you to rank order potential event topics. Barbara, myself, Paul, and others developed this initial preliminary risk list of potential topics based on our understanding of priority items for the incoming administration, for example, kleptocracy, and recent developments or persistent issues in the DRD space that all of you are very much aware of, for example, uh, backsliding. To refresh your memory, uh, here are nine topics listed in order of the number of votes they received, and I will drop them into the, the chat shortly. So first, democratic backsliding and closing space for civil society, both analytic approaches to understanding the problem, as well as what are some evidence-based programming interventions to counter it or even better prevent it. Second, digital democracy, broadly conceived, technology, social media, as well as disinformation. Third, setting forth a DRG agenda for the next decade, the Biden administration, but also beyond. Fourth, are you linked to that countering kleptocracy, understanding it as well as programmatic interventions. Fifth, understanding and addressing the impact of China's engagement on development and democracy. Sixth, the importance of DRG to implementation of the recently passed and released Global Fragility Act and associated strategy. Seventh, good governance and effective health systems. Eighth, human rights and DRG assistance, in particular addressing abuses against minority populations. Ninth and finally, private sector involvement in governance programs. We'll do our best to come to an agreement today on these two events. If we're unable to do so, I think Barbara and I will take all of these into account and try to make that final determination in a way that best reflects your perspectives. So from here, we wanna get your inputs on these topics. Given that we're a small group, I think we can just have people chime in or raise your hand like this, vice the, the click function. So over to Barbara to begin the discussion on that and I'll put the topics in the chat. Great. I'll give um, Patrick just a moment to put those in the chat. I know that was a, a lot of content, okay. So we have uh, the topics in the chat. Again, he mentioned the survey that we conducted. One thing I wanted to ask uh, up front too is, you know, looking at this again now, is there anything you all think is missing? Is there any, um, are there any modifications that you would make to, to what's currently uh, listed? Um, I, I'm uh, looking at, okay, uh, Irving, I, please. Yeah, I, one, one question in terms of the discussion that goes on. Uh, have all of you actually served overseas and been in touch with the uh, developing countries that we're talking about? Or is this a lot of top-down stuff? I just want to get some background. That's, I, I don't know everyone's background here, but, uh, you know, for myself, yes, I've served overseas in a number of different places, both with USAID and, uh, partner organizations, pretty sure a, a number of people here have also done that as well. But that's a good point in terms of looking at the, the topics from that perspective. And I wonder uh, two things. One, um, just throwing this out to Patrick as well. Um, if given what Irving has just said, if you would, if anything just strikes you or or being, if anything strikes you, is to 
uh, you know, should these be worded in a different way or should, is there a particular topic that's missing? So Barbara, if I could, maybe just one addition to what you just said is that whatever topics we select or you know, uh, give top priority, like we did with the thinking and working politically, we make sure that the voices are from the field and not necessarily from Washington telling everyone how things should be done. Um, I think that's a, an approach to get at also what's being suggested. Thanks. Yeah, Irene, that Lisa raised a good point. We uh, recently, uh, when was it? actually it's not so recently anymore. Um, I think the summer had an yeah, end of July. July, yeah. Thinking and working politically, and we had I think four recorded uh, voices from the field, and then we had a dis panel discussion, which also included voices from the field. So that is obviously a very important part of of that the engagement that we have. And to chime in just briefly, I'm one of the parts of the meeting will be certainly agreeing on the topics broadly conceived, but once there is some agreement there, thinking through the ideal format for these sessions, so voices from the field, perhaps DC, even getting down into names of potential speakers, all good points. I mean, I, I don't want to overdo this. You, you talked about voices from the field, but my first assignment was in Turkey in 1950. And the thing that made that useful is at that point, we had an anthropologist, professional anthropologist, who's part of the public administration program. And that made such a big difference for somebody who it really understood, taught us how to understand local culture. Because I, I, I may be repeating what everybody knows, but in the Old days when aid was created, it's we told them what to do. But the world has now changed. And I spent a lot of time in Africa and I spent a lot of time in the field, sitting with the Tuareg, talking to them, finding out what they wanted. And my, my role was to work with them to help them create what it is that they wanted. You know, I, I when I was in, the, in Mali, uh, you know, uh, they wanted a huge hospital out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And uh, my, uh, I, I ended up convincing them, how about having just a, um, a clinic and the hospital would be in Senegal or in Bamako. It's that kind of getting the feel for what they want and that it is our role, all of those who are sitting here, is to get the local people to decide what they want and help them to create what they want. Uh, it may not be the form that we have here in the United States, but there are certain guiding principles that you know we as professionals think that, uh, uh, you, know, you, uh, you know, how, how local people do it. I may be overstating that, but in my many, many years working, uh, you know, that is the kind of thing that I thought I learned best. And I'll close with this. One of the most useful things I ever did was, I forget which African country, there was a pregnant woman. And I said, you have to now wash your hands every day. And that was something that was surprising to her. She didn't understand why. That's how basic the getting the local people to do what is necessary for them. I'll sign off. Thanks, Irene. Um, Luke? Yeah, just uh, briefly, and, and perhaps this comment fits more in the context of a lens through which we look at whatever the top selected uh, topics are, but um, I don't know if it's worth mentioning COVID and its effect on some of these different elements. I know, you know, ranging from exacerbating challenges to opening new opportunities for more digital outreach um, in terms of citizen government engagement um, to uh, also opening up more avenues for things like kleptocracy and corruption um, in different in places as well. So that may be more of a cross-cutting thing that comes up later in the conversation, but just wanted to flag that. No, 
was great. Um, I think both what you, what, what Irving mentioned and what you mentioned are cross-cutting in some ways. I know a number, for example, um, I think, I believe, and, and uh, Paul uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but a number of other uh, working groups are also dealing with this issue of decolonizing development or looking at community-driven development um, or, or sort of trying to, trying to address that angle, but also COVID as well has come up and um, how COVID has changed development, impacted development, is I believe come up in the other, um, uh, some of the other working groups as well. Um, those are both good suggestions. Uh, I know we need to get to other folks as well. Uh, Luke, did you have something else? Your, your hand's still up. Um, no, sorry. Okay, no, it's okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Um, no, thank Lula. you. Um, hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks, I just wanted to make the point about, um, I, I recently worked on, um, on a proposal for the ACES IDIQ, which is USAID's going to be a contracting mechanism and, and our company was in BAP also and I managed the proposal. So I know that the way the USAID is, is, is going to be approaching DRG and hopefully they are already, it's about integration, integrating DRG issues into all the development sectors. And I think in line with that, perhaps we need to be kind of, you know, in step with that. And, and I think it would, it might help to mainstream, you know, some of these nine topics um, when we talk about integrating DRG into, uh, into, you know, be it uh, health or energy or service delivery or municipal, um, you know, municipal services. And we see more and more, I mean, for us who, who, who are DRG practitioners, we've always integrated DRG in everything that we do. Um, now, hopefully it's going to be formalized. And so, um, and I also, the other point I wanted to raise is that the USA transformation with the new DDI Bureau, um, there, there may be an opportunity as well to elevate DRG issues. Uh, as you know, they have not been sufficiently, I think, incorporated or addressed uh, with the agency historically, there has not been resources, you know, that kind of uh, g give them its due. So perhaps also with the new structure and that new uh, larger bureau, there's an opportunity to um, to do that as well. Um, so I just want to trace those two issues. Thank you. Thanks. Those are that's the the integration of DRG as as a number of people know on this uh, call is very near and dear my heart it was part of what we we uh, when I was at USA um, uh, added as a key element to the 2013 DRG strategy so the integration across sector um, so appreciate that comment as well um, Lisa you had your I thought you had your hand up a minute ago did you want to chime in on any of this yeah I just uh, I agree actually um, with Rula that uh, DRG integration there's a number of the topics that suggest that so I would uh, I would strongly support that. Thanks. Great. Any other new topics or modifications to existing topics that folks would recommend? Angela? Yes, thanks. Um, I do um, want to second the COVID suggestion, the COVID impact su suggestion. And then also we might consider something uh, along the lines of um, youth political participation. We've done a few events um, at IFAS and um, they were really well received. We had a great participation with uh, partners in the field. Um, very inspiring. <laughs> Not everything is in the sector right now. Um, also inclusion could be a topic for consideration. And lastly, the democracy summit that Biden has promised, uh, we might consider doing a side event to that uh, in some respect. Could you expand on your point related to inclusion? There's so many different aspects we could cover. So I'm, I'm curious to know well, what specifically. Yes, there certainly are. <laughs> uh, and so we could make it narrow or quite broad. Um, inclusion encompassing um, all marginalized populations, uh, you know, across, um, you know, abilities and, um, and race, uh, we could do, you know, quite a bit around that. What does it, what does inclusion uh, mean in different places? There's quite a, a bit of variation, and um, so that could be interesting. A comparative analysis. Thank you. 
Any other, uh, Andrea, please. Yes, um, I think, there, I mean, it's a topic which is uh, uh, somehow intrinsic to many of these points, but I think that probably would be interesting and worth mentioning inequality, inequality as a challenge that goes beyond uh, economics and, and includes uh, inequality in, in terms of uh, political participation, uh, broader political rights, uh, etc., which is uh, uh, being affected by, I mean, it's already existing uh, a, a, and being affected further by, by COVID uh, impacts, both economically and politically. Thank you. Great, thanks. So we've, I think we've had, by my count, four, four that have, uh, uh, supported the idea of adding COVID as a topic as well. So just noting that we have broad um, support for that. And then I, I just wanted to make sure everyone has saw the note from Lisa um, suggesting that we soften the term kleptocracy and expand to anti-corruption, transparency, and accountability. So any other um, comments before we move on to discuss this uh, prioritization of topics. Anything? Okay, I'll hand back over to Patrick. Thanks, Barbara and Angela. Great point on inclusion and use. You know, if not a standalone event, certainly a component. I would argue of any topic we choose is something we should explore. So, getting to trying to get to agreement on selection of the, the topics listed in the chat, those nine, as well as the other ideas posed, are there strong feelings on which ones we definitely should select? And if so, uh, why? I think having something um, related to the new Biden uh, administration and what their agenda is, you know, at the appropriate time when they've had time to plan would be highly popular and very, uh, I think, helpful for, for, uh, for everyone. Um, I would also say that maybe we could combine some of these ideas into a little bit of a uh, a, smor a smorgasbord is not the right word, but um, uh, new approaches in uh, DRG or something like that. You know, the, the digital uh, democracy, um, some of them could be packaged together. So th th those are my two points. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Lisa, both various points and either with the, the Biden administration angle or combining would give us the opportunity to feature a number of these topics together. Roll, I do see your hand up. I'm not sure if that's a holdover from your previous comment or a new one, but do want to make sure that we give the opportunity. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a holdover. I put it okay. in the chat. I, I like the digital democracy one, uh, you know, and, and maybe it's digital governance because, you know, um, <laughs> it might be broader because uh, it's not necessarily democracy being promoted digitally, <laughs> as we're now seeing, but all types of governance structures, sadly. Yeah, great point, whether it's uh, civic tech, gov tech, all different types of angles to, to tackle that. Other thoughts? Strong feelings on any of these topics? So Patrick, I wanted to just jump in and, and ask, a, ask this question in a, a little bit of a different way. Um, I, I thank you, Lisa, for the suggestion of sort of synthesizing some of these together, I think both around sort of the Biden agenda and then around um, sort of new approaches. I wonder, is there anything that's an outlier from those two topics that we don't think could be folded in, but that we do think needs to still be addressed? Um, I imagine COVID could be discussed in the context of both the sort of how the Biden administration is going to shift or alter its approach. Um, and, but also in terms of new approaches, I think, you know, digital, for example, is something that, um, you know, uh, I know for us, for example, I think we're doing a bit, quite a bit more in that space because of the limitations in terms of face-to-face -face engagement. And we've all had to innovate um, around sort of use of, of uh, uh, social media, et cetera. Um, 
but are there are there others that that we should be that that we would be remiss and not uh, not also uh, sort of identifying and discussing? Any thoughts? Barbara, just a question. I wonder if we narrow it down to a certain number of topics, do we want to send it out to the listserv and sit and have people quote unquote vote for what, what they uh, uh, are most interested in? Is that something that uh, the subgroup has done before? That's a great question. I'm going to toss that over to Paul. You know, we sent the, the survey out initially, um, but once we narrow this down, I don't know if it has gone back to the, the working group. So Paul, can you chime in on that? And then Matt, I do see your, Matthew, I see your hands up. So we'll get to you next. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Um, after the fact, no. Uh, it's usually during the meeting itself that we discuss and the co-chairs and myself, we decide. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of programs for CIDW. Um, so help manage all of these different programs that we do, all these different events that we do. Um, but that's long story short is no, um, usually it's up to myself and the co-chairs. Emphasis on co-chairs. Sure, my volume just sort of uh, dropped for a second. Apologies if you're waiting. Um, you know, I'm not, it's very broad, but uh, it's hard for me to leave the backsliding behind. Um, and I'm wondering if possibly some of these elements, including digital governance, et cetera, are, are a piece of that puzzle and couldn't be folded under that if that indeed as a topic remains too broad, looking at everything from countries within the EU to of course the United States to the arrest in Hong Kong last night to uh, on and on and on. Um, of course, the ongoing struggles in, in the, some of the developing countries where we work. Um, it's hard for me to leave it behind as a topic that is relevant, uh, will be something that the Biden administration confronts, um, is in fact kind of struggling with and will enter with that with those headwinds, uh, making democracy relevant still. So I don't know where it fits. Again, I recognize it's awfully broad. Um, but again, I, I just uh, hesitate to, to let it slide off the agenda entirely. Um, so I guess, I guess, uh, Patrick, I don't know if, do you want to move to sort of a discussion of the planning for sessions? You feel comfortable for volunteers who, who could help? It's one of the things we're looking for, of course, are, um, but also volunteers that can help us shape these, um, as well, um, into those, uh, you know, especially if we're going to be synthesizing some of these topics, um, like, backsliding, which is, can be, you know, so broad. Um, and for example, I will just uh, give a shout out to, you know, Lisa and Jarek um, from RTI were just instrumental in making our last event such a great success um, on, on political economy analysis and thinking and working politically. So just uh, anyway, over to Patrick for that part of the discussion. Yeah, that sounds good. I think it seems like at least for one of the event topics, there is some consensus around the need to focus on what the Biden administration's DRG agenda might be. So worth talking through what format we all think would make the most sense, how to structure that, and even speakers. So open the floor to all of you for your thoughts. Sure, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, I think obviously on that one, the extent to which we could get someone from the Biden administration to be a speaker uh, would be sort of the primary one. So, um, you know, for those who have connections to whoever is going to be coming in, uh, I think that would uh, that would be helpful. Another group that in the past we've we've had uh, drawing in on some of these, uh, and this relates to the Democratic backsliding, is Tom Carruthers at Carnegie is, is always a really good uh, speaker. And he's also a draw. A lot of people want to hear what he has to say. So 
you know, what when we when we move to selecting topics, uh, that's that's someone who might be worth uh, reaching out to uh, to see if he would be be willing to to be a speaker as well. And then just uh, on on some of the other things, one of the things in the past that has worked well is to get one of the other um, SID work groups to co-sponsor uh, with us. So the I think the one that jumps to mind, given that we've talked about COVID, is to co-sponsor something with the health group. Uh, but there are you know there are multiple other uh, work groups out there as well. Uh, I think in the past we we done something with the the knowledge one. Um, and then there's, you know, there's some private sector ones as well. So thinking just beyond our own work group, but uh, reaching out to some of the other ones is also a good, uh, a good approach. Yeah, thanks, Derek. All good points. Uh, certainly, Tom is always a draw, a very smart individual. Uh, based on other comments earlier on in the discussion, perhaps by an administration official, either Tom Carruthers or members of our work group laying out what the challenges are, and then one or two people speaking to what new approaches exist to confront those challenges, including wrapping in COVID. Just a few thoughts to your consideration. Uh, Rola, I see your hands up. Yeah, I wanted to say that, that perhaps, you know, one, uh, one topic or one type of event that would hit multiple birds with one stone is um, perhaps talking about the importance of governance and, 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 and democracy and rights when it comes to climate change. We know climate change is going to be huge for the Biden administration. And when we talk about integration again, you know, the DRG issues when it comes to environment and, and those types of, of global issues um, could open up opportunities also to, uh, to collaborate with the Sid Washington Environment uh, Group and, and, and maybe some others. And perhaps you could get uh, Kerry himself, you know, you know uh, he's going to be the new, the new envoy. So, so there's a lot of opportunities, I think, where you can appeal to broader audiences if you combine uh, these two topics, because I think climate change in particular is a, is a, is a global challenge that requires a lot of governance um, in terms of capacity, commitment. You can talk about the journey to self-reliance. There's a lot of things that kind of click naturally. So, um, so I would recommend a kind of that. Another idea that I had is perhaps also, if you are going to pick up the issue of, of, of uh, the backsliding and perhaps thinking of, uh, of uh, regions in the world, you know, if you wanted to talk about the Middle East, for example, or try to, to do something that appeals to, to regions. Uh, we're seeing a lot of action in the Middle East. I'm, I'm calling you from Beirut, actually. Um, I'm, I'm based out of here. And, and so and that's my geographic area of expertise. But, but we are seeing a lot of changes uh, in the region, backsliding and, and also um, uh, geopolitical shifts that, that, that have a lot of, um, I think they're going to be a challenge to the Biden administration, but also could provide opportunities. So uh, that, these are just some two, two suggestions. Yeah, thanks for all so the great what, points. Go ahead, Lisa, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Um, one other note on the backsliding is that, um, I guess it's topic number uh, five about um, China's influence. There's lots of other influences. I don't want to focus just on China, but it seems like one in five might um, have a connection that there's democratic backsliding, what kind of influences are affecting that both internally in a country, but also external influences that are, are um, encouraging it, I guess is the, the point. So I would be, I think that would be a really interesting topic and very relevant one that's been um, coming up a lot. And I know that uh, the DRG Center, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, set up a team uh, that works on that topic. I don't know who, who leads it or where they are on their agenda, but there is a separate team working on that. Thanks. Yeah, great point, Lisa, that so-called external malign influence and will feature prominently with the, this administration as it did with the Trump administration. Other thoughts and inputs on an event focused on helping set the Biden administration's DRG agenda? So I do, I do know someone that's, that's on the transition team uh, for the Biden campaign, who is a former State Department and USAID, um, who was part of the agency review, um, I think for state or USAID as well. 
he could definitely put me in touch um, if you wanted some uh, contacts for the DRG or, or um, region specific, um, let me know and I can definitely reach out to him. Great, thanks for a lot. Just one, one quick question um, with regards to some of the, taking this through the lens of the Biden administration and some of the priorities, um, was that sort of the thinking, and apologies, I, I was not one of the ones who filled out the survey beforehand, but was that one of the thinking, some of the thinking behind uh, the sixth point there about the uh, Global Fragility Act um, and the Global Fragility Strategy? Uh, was it, was the, the thought there to kind of link it to the Biden administration as well, just given that that's such an, um, an overt U.S. government um, avenue of thinking. I don't know if that's what the thought there was, but I, I think that would also fit nicely under the framing of the Biden administration um, and would also tie into a couple of the other uh, elements that have been talked about as well already, the malign influence as well as Democratic backsliding. So just a thought there. Yeah, number six really meant to encapsulate the intersection between, as you know quite well, Luke, conflict and governance, and whether we focus just on the strategy itself or lump that into the broader event where we put forth those recommendations for the new Biden folks. I think either way, discussing at least briefly um, DRG assistance in conflict-affected areas should be a focus of that particular event. Um, so, Patrick, one other uh, point about your question about the Biden administration, hearing from them what their initial thoughts are, but, you know, and I don't know the answer to this, but what are those voices that we want to bring um, to bear to influence what they're going to focus in on? And kind of to Irving's point early on is what are those voices from outside the U.S., um, particularly in developing countries that we can bring um, to more uh, influence the agenda and uh, uh, sharpen it. Thanks. Yeah, excellent point. And that gets to even the continued discussion on the format of the event, who we bring a speaker to make sure that whatever arguments are being presented are being made by folks who can do so in the most compelling fashion. So certainly welcome your thoughts, Lisa, and those from others in the group as to who that should be. We could definitely give it some thought about what, what are, who are those people that might um, be able to bring their viewpoint. Uh, I'm gonna put Derek on the spot. Um, any thoughts on that uh, side, Derek, of, of voices outside of the US to influence and uh, influence and enlighten the agenda? Well, I think as we know, there there are some um, some think tanks in developing countries, and we might be able to to, to tap into them. Uh, one thing that might be uh, interesting if we could pull it off would be to do some sort of survey prior to the event, um, and you know, obviously it would be would be limited, but nonetheless collecting some. Uh, some thoughts, so not just relying on whether we could get a speaker from a particular country or not, uh, but bringing in some other voices. And there may, you know, there may be some organizations out there who would be willing to do sort of like a little mini survey for us, um, you know, to, to sort of tap into some of the concerns. Uh, and I, you know, I think we can kind of identify what those are, um, but just hearing what people's particular takes uh, on them uh, are, I think, would would help to inform the event, and and as Irv was saying, sort of make make it more, uh, you know, not just a Washington type event, but uh, but some voices from the field as well. Thanks, Derek. We can think through the logistics around that, but good, definitely a good point. Other thoughts on this first potential event topic. Uh, if not, that's okay. Barbara and I can put our heads together and try to aggregate all the good thoughts presented here and go back out to select members of the group who have expressed interest in helping uh, plan this for additional thoughts. And certainly Lisa, Derek, and others would add, and Rola ask you follow up with Barbara and myself with the speaker ideas as well as the connection that, that Rola mentioned. So I'll hand it back over to Barbara to help walk us through 
the, the second potential event topic. Great, and just for, I think we had at least one or two folks join um, uh, just while we've had been uh, discussing these topics, just to catch them up. Um, we've had a discussion about the, um, both the uh, listed potential topics for our uh, DRG working group, the uh, events coming up uh, that are listed in the chat, there are nine, and then we've, we've sort of um, come to consensus around two broad themes. Um, one is on um, sort of uh, looking at both the Biden administration's priorities um, in DRG, and then the second one, which we're gonna discuss now, um, key challenges and new approaches in DRG. And um, in my notes, and this is where I'll ask those of you who've been part of the discussion to chime in, what I've, what I've captured is, um, you know, malign influence uh, and democratic backsliding as uh, a key challenge. Of course, um, working in the COVID context as a key challenge. Um, opportunities include, uh, you know, digital, both a challenge and opportunity, this falls into both, is sort of the digital democracy and governance aspect. Um, integration, I think, falls into both. You know, this is, this is something we recognize now is important, but you know, how do we how do we um, make sure that we're doing this effectively? And then, of course, um, you know, uh, elevating voices and empowering uh, you know our, the field is also something that I think is is a, something we're focused on. But you know, what is the right approach? Um, what are the lessons? Um, and of course, making sure that. Any event we we have does uh, does highlight um, those voices. I really liked Lisa's suggestion of um, reaching out to think tanks. I just wanted to to also emphasize that that are sort of non U.S. based think tanks. Um, I've seen some great pieces from from some of those uh, South Africa think tank, Indonesia think tank, etc. Um, on sort of sort of sort of some of these topics. So I'll open the open up to this, the group. Anything I missed? Anything else that should be included in challenges and approaches? David. Uh, sure. I, I apologize. I joined late. I couldn't get the link to work, but I'll thank you for sending it later. Um, yeah, one you may have already discussed, but it seems to me would be worth considering is just the rise and spread of populism. It's certainly one that we've had um, recent experience with um, um, out of step with uh, much of our history, but um, it's certainly one that's not unique to us. Um, we're seeing it both in developing and developed countries. And I think that presents, as we know, significant challenges to the stability of, of uh, democratic institutions. And in some ways is a threat that has a bit of paradox in it because it's mobilizing masses of uh, people who perceive themselves as marginalized. So it has a democratic tenor to it, but um, often leads to very undemocratic um, outcomes. Great. Anything else? That's it for me. Thank you. Matt, or do you go by Matt or Matthew? Sorry. Oh, Matt's fine. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, Matthew. When I introduce myself, because of the uh, hard single syllable last name, it can sound like Mark. But I'm Matt to everyone else. Um, I was just thinking in terms of format. The second top, the key topics and challenges in DRG, and then we listed a, a, a quite a few, and we've already talked about, um, you know, speakers from think tanks. But I could envision a panel format in which. Uh, time zones notwithstanding. Yeah, I mean, there's beyond just think tanks, we have scholars, academics um, in these countries. We have um, uh, CSOs, of course, and human rights leaders, journalists. So I could see quite a, a diverse panel, both geographically and then kind of by profession that might be able to cut into this and then in the spirit of Irving's kind of kickoff comment and really um, deepen the uh, perspectives from, from the countries in question. That's it. That's great. Um, one of the things we did for the Thinking and Working Politically event was um, 
videos, so short videos, uh, you know, that helps with the challenge of the, the time zones, you know, if it's 2 a.m. In, a, in a, another country when we're meeting, you know, then at least we can capture that voice um, if they're unable, if someone's unable to participate. So great, great point about the sort of broader array, array of uh, potential participants, CSOs, journalists, et cetera. Um, Luke. Yeah, just sort of building off the expanded um, opportunities for, for different voices, um, as well as particularly if we're bringing together a bunch of different topics, um, breakout groups post a plenary session, maybe uh, also a, a, something to consider for the format. You know, particularly if we're talking about something like um, democratic backsliding, that takes so many different forms. Uh, and being able to dive a little deeper on certain manifestations within that space may be interesting. Um, and could also allow us to bring in, again, more, more voices, whether that's from different countries and contexts or within those different specialties. Um, it's something to maybe consider for the formatting. Good idea. We're always challenged by the time limitations. Thoughts? Irving, you look like you're about to say something. Well, uh, I'm uncomfortable. I was a mission director and my guidance to my staff is it's up to us in the field to decide what we do, whether it was public administration or agriculture, but because of my training in public administration, my belief, my belief, I've said before, that it's up to the local people to do things. And therefore my guidance to my staff in the field is don't bother with Washington, don't ask them questions, uh, take what they say and put it in the corner, and decide how we in the field, in dealing with the local people, with the local cultures, with the local issues is what we're concerned with. Now, everything here that you've talked about saying sounds great. I'm a professor at American University. And you know, what are we here in the United States doing great things about Biden, et cetera? Fine, interesting academically, but uh, I'm uncomfortable about all of this. I, I don't care what Biden does. I want to know what President X, Y, or Z of, of Senegal or other countries do. That for me, you know, these are all important issues that you're working on. They're fine, you're intellectual. But for me, what the goal of foreign aid is to get the local people what is the impact of the rainy season in the Sahel on carrying out the uh, uh, health? I, I don't know. I mean, those are the issues that I'm concerned with, very little of what this is concerned with. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm repeating what I'm saying, but uh, my guidance to my staff, people in the field, forget what Washington says, Forget what those people do. What is it that we in the field, what do we want the Senegalese to do? What is their desire? And so on. I'm repeating myself now, but it's it's an entirely different world than what everybody here has been talking about. So Barbara, maybe if I could, if it's okay, I'll, I'll comment on that. I think we all uh, understand what you're saying, Irvin, and we we, we agree with you, but um, missions, I've, I used to work for USAID and missions are highly influenced by what um, new Washington approaches, new initiatives, how the funding not, comes to we them. We weren't. We set well, we, them aside. We don't listen to them. We hide them. We tell lies to Washington so that we, so the guys in Washington think they're doing great things. But if it, it, it's we who decide what we want in our countries, screw Washington. <laughs> um, 
I, I think we're trying to get at what you're saying by uh, having you know, the think tanks from the countries that, uh, and, and trying to identify um, good insights from That's from a good idea. Folks. Think yeah, tanks that, in local countries. How right, do we work with them? How do we help them? What do we find out it, it is that they want? How do they impact on the culture of their governments, their people to achieve their development? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Irving. I think one of the the notes I made was you've Irving, you've referenced culture a number of times and the anthrop the the uh, the comment you made earlier on anthropology um as well. Um trying to think about how to integrate that as well. Um maybe it's you know, I know at the one of the organizations that I worked at, the Asia Foundation. Um, we we had an emphasis on hiring anthropologists for that very reason. This idea that you you need a very deep understanding of local culture um, and practices. So taking copious notes, uh, uh, and we'll think about how we can better integrate um, and consider uh, and make it, make this more field driven. I guess is where I'm going with that. Um, that being said, I think what Lisa said as well is. Uh, is very valid having worked in both the field and in headquarters for USAID and for partner organizations. You know, there is, you know, budgets are decided, so the funding is decided you know, out of Washington. Um, so there is a there is a relationship there that is perhaps worth exploring as well. Um, anything, one thing I wanted to, to just mention um, before we move on is are a couple other themes that were uh, listed as possible topics uh, that we haven't discussed. Um, one is private sector involvement in governance programs, and two is human rights uh, and addressing abuses against minority populations. Those were two that haven't yet come up, and I wanted to just make sure or hear from this group to see if, if either of those should be things that we are integrating or incorporating into the two sort of med meta themes that we've we've um, uh, sort of uh, in principle agreed to. Um, in particular, new challenges and new approaches in DRG or either of these things we should make sure are, are integrated, mindful of the fact that we already have about four or five other issues we wanna discuss. Thoughts? Matt? Yeah, gosh, um, I know we already have a lot on our plates, but um... Someone mentioned climate change, and I apologize for uh, missing who, who brought that up. But related, where I'm going is the intersection um, with the democratic backsliding. There's been sporadic news, but it's become quite a phenomenon. I'm, I'm most, or I have been historically working in Central America and South America, where climate activism has um, been confronted by uh, violent backlash. Um, sometimes uh, supported directly or indirectly by um, central government. So that uh, governance of climate change and then climate activism, of course, this relates very much to uh, local com communities, priorities, econ economic development priorities, um, the effects they're seeing with climate, climate adaptation, resilience. So there's a lot of cross-cutting there. I realize that's open-ended, but I'll, I'll perhaps throw it in there. It's something I've been watching and certainly preoccupies me um, personally, and it, and it seems to dovetail, at least in some level, with democratic backsliding and climate change. Matthew, a question. What is it that local countries in the field can do about climate change? Yeah, well, I have a, 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 I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to that in the sense that, uh, I mean, as you well know, and I'm, I'm by no means a climate scientist, but you know, the, the carbon that's driving our issues is not stemming usually from these communities, um, but rather you know, the United States, China, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I look at it very much in terms of adaptation, you know, uh, resilience, but really I'm more, no, you know, we, we've got serious issues with food security um, coming down the pike, we already see that. Um, we're already seeing, well, migration. Uh, the last big project I worked on was in Ethiopia where 
And now, of course, you have Ethiopians fleeing uh, to some of the countries from where the refugees I was working with were coming from, um, driven directly or indirectly, depending on your point of view or your argumentation on climate. Um, so we see a lot of downstream ripple effects of, of severe climate change effects on the ground now. Um, and what I'm seeing uh, is, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there is literature out there and documentation and there are projects on resilience and, and there are meaningful outcomes from some of those. So I don't want to be dismissive out of hand, um, you know, using local natural materials to limit riverbank cutting, um, you know, social capital enterprises and, and village and saving loans organizations, et cetera, um, in an effort to build sort of the, the asset base and um, to respond to climate shocks, so on and so forth. Um, that's great, but I'm also seeing at the same time, you know, preponderance of negative coping strategies around out migration, you know, like in Nepal and to the Middle East. And, and so again, um, <laughs> where to draw the line, frankly, in terms of the level of analysis, um, in terms of, uh, you know, the analytical lens through which you look at this, but I see a host of, of quite deleterious downstream effects. And, and, and now I have to stop because it's beyond my sky. I don't know um, what the best answer is, but it's something that I think communities are confronting now and um, is a real challenge. And I think a lot of countries are under-resourced and, and, and on the back foot and um, in a very difficult spot. Uh, both politically and then economically to, to cope with these challenges. As a bit of a monologue, apologies. Um, happy to pick this up, Irving, either here or in another venue. Sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, Matt. We've had a couple others just join us. Uh, Rick O'Sullivan and Neil Levine. I was wondering if you could just quickly uh, let's start with Neil. Introduce yourself to the group. Good morning, everybody. Well, this is a very cozy group. I'm happy to be here. My name is Neil Levine. I'm coming to you from Beverly, Massachusetts. Um, I have um, been a great admirer of this um, community of practice for a long time and uh, delighted to be here. Folks who don't know me, I am uh, recently, well, three years ago, retired from a career at USAID in Capitol Hill. I served at various times as the director of the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. And then my last job was as director of the Center of Excellence for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance. I've had the pleasure of working with many of you over uh, that time in different roles and pleased to be here this morning. Thank you. Great, thanks, Neil. Rick? Uh, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you, Barbara. And I apologize for coming in late. I couldn't find the link. Um, I'm Rick O'Sullivan. I'm a civil society specialist. I founded and chaired the civil society work group at Sid Washington for seven years uh, before it was folded back into, uh, well, it didn't get back into, it was folded into uh, VRNG. Uh, uh, my specialization has been helping civil society organizations become self-sustaining and donor independent. That's the only way you're really going to get credible uh, civil society representation when you're no longer dependent on government support. Uh, a key to that is uh, civil society as an alternative to uh, government and governance. In fact, I uh, passed a paper on to uh, Barbara and Patrick. I don't know if I share them here. Uh, called when government when governance is not government, uh, the people would be surprised. Most governments uh, would be surprised when I tell them that in developed economies, uh, the nonprofit sector is responsible for seventy five percent or more of all regulatory responsibilities, uh, and that that means here in the U S. Uh, federal, state, and local governments combined account for less than a quarter. Yet uh, the role of civil society in, as part of the governance process is practically unknown among development professionals. Uh, they seem to limit the role to that of, uh, of advocacy or watchdog, which creates the adversarial 
relationship uh, that I, it has been played a major role in the closing of civil society space. So I'm going to encourage this group to spend some time this, uh, this year focusing on the governing role of civil society, uh, where it can uh, diffuse the, the authority out of the government and reduce the, uh, the trend towards uh, closing the entire space and, and profits. And, and having questions, I'd rather answer. Thanks, Rick. Mike, uh, so I'm going to try to pronounce your last name, Storazinich. Uh, hi, welcome. Could you also just briefly introduce yourself, your name, and your organization? Or Good job on my surname. Thank you. Nice to see you. <laughs> And Rick O'Sullivan, who I last saw probably at uh, one of the SID events uh, from Colombia about uh, peacemaking in Colombia several years ago by now, five years ago, I think. So I, I was one of the uh, co-chairs of the Peace and Security Committee and the uh, Democracy and kind of, uh, Post-Conflict uh, uh, co-chair as well, which is now, I think, um, kind of s s sifted out into a more sensible arrangement of democracy, rights, and governance on the one hand, peace and security on the other. So I'm, I'm very glad to see this um, change. I just rejoined Sid this morning uh, in order to attend this event, which shows how events can uh, prompt membership. And I held back only because I think I remember uh, if you join in December, you have to rejoin in January anyway. So I'm a bit late. I'm therefore totally unprepared for any conversation we may have. And I expect to uh, kind of sit in the background and listen to hear uh, what you all have to say. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. So uh, Rick, Neil, and Mike, you, I think, joined at a good time in some ways. We, we debated uh, the nine proposed topics that are uh, in the chat, if you scroll up, and uh, then discussed a couple. We, we asked for suggestions for those potential topics that aren't listed there and where we are currently, just to summarize, Patrick, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is around sort of two meta topics, uh, DR, the DRG agenda um, under, you know, uh, for the next decade and beyond uh, and uh, the Biden administration, sort of where is the Biden administration going to go? Um, we thought that was logical uh, given uh, the transition and timing. Uh, and then the second, which is a, even broader, is uh, key challenges and new approaches in DRG. And under that topic, we've just to summarize, um, talked about uh, you know, uh, malign influence and democratic backsliding um, as you know, a key challenge. We talked about climate change as a key challenge or recently that's not listed on the, in the nine topics. Um, we also, um, a number of participants wanted to include or said that it was important that we think about all of this in the context of COVID. And I would even broaden that to pandemics um, because WHO has said that this may not even be the big one. Um, so uh, COVID may not be the big one. And then, um, so opportunities included sort of and, and challenges, uh, digital democracy and governance, um, integration, and uh, I, we also touched on, uh, but haven't discussed in great detail, uh, you know, the rise of populism, both as, you know, an opportunity, but also a challenge. And uh, I just made a note of um, Rick, and I'm glad you joined, it, you know, civil society. Uh, so that's sort of where we are, is around these sort of meta topics. And then in terms of format and speakers, uh, I, and I'd love to circle back to speakers now and I'll hand over to Patrick because um, we, we are gonna have to, to wrap up soon. Um, you know, in terms of format, there's been a heavy emphasis on the need to incorporate and integrate uh, and you know, have the field in many ways lead this discussion. Um, so how do we best do that um, as a sort of, you know, US-based entity, you know, through videos, through working, for, through uh, breakout groups during the, the discussions, um, you know, et cetera. Um, and then uh, in terms of suggestion for 
um, specific speakers uh, for topic number two, key challenges. Tom Carruthers' name came up. Um, and for the former on the Biden administration, of course, it'd be great to have a representative from uh, the new administration. Uh, and then we, we didn't really get into uh, sort of specific speakers from the field, but we did discuss um, a number of named think tanks. Uh, so for example, Rula mentioned uh, the Islam Ferris Institute at the American University of Beirut. So that's sort of where we are, um, just to, sort of to kind of wrap up. Patrick, did I miss anything uh, in my list? No, that's a great summary. Thanks so much, great. Barbara. So back think, over to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, good to see you, Neil, Rick. Thanks for taking the time to join and Mike as well. Uh, what we'd like to do the last 10 minutes here before we wrap up is any final thoughts on either event vis-a-vis -vis particular speakers you have in mind or especially for event number two, that key challenges, opportunities and approaches, particular, maybe even sub themes you all would want us to focus on. Uh, Barbara and I, I'll do so soon. I've dropped her email into the chat. So if anything comes to mind after the event, feel free to be in touch and share thoughts uh, by email as well. So um, any final thoughts yet. Sure, Irving, go ahead. Yeah, Neil, or Rosenthal. Uh, one of the things everybody knows that Neil has been very active in the aid mentoring program. And I think one of the key items in the mentoring program is it's important to get the mentees in the field to know what Washington wants, but it's important as far as I'm concerned that we experienced aid people are able to work with the mentees in the field to help them and teach them to learn how to work with local governments focusing on local issues. Neil, you were not here in the earlier session, but how, I mean, what I just said, what is your view on that? Uh, that is, uh, on public administration, is it uh, what we do in the United States or how we get the local people, our aid people, in the field to learn to work with local people, deal with them, find out what they want, and help to, you know, move them along? Yeah, that's probably another um, seminar, but just quickly, I think the, my, my first take on it is really uh, helps to put on my other hat as board chair for CDA collaborative development, because this is right in our wheelhouse of um, kind of privileging, spotlighting, and engaging local actors and local agency. And I don't know if, if folks know CDA, but that's basically... Um, its mandate early on was to, in essence, find out from local actors what it is like to be on the business end of foreign aid or the receiving end. And from that early work, um, some groundbreaking work on do no harm in the humanitarian space and on reflective peace practice. And so IRV right now in its most current iteration is working quite closely with USAID's Office of Local Works and is about to, I hope, get awarded a follow-on for something that's called Stopping as Success, which is really about um, translating um, best practice for responsible aid exits so that when we transition out, we're leaving something um, sustainable behind. Um, and um, from that work, I think we are trying to broaden out to uh, what does localization really mean? And rather than being our thoughts about what it means is to hear directly from local actors. And so to specifically answer your question, I would tell my aid mentees to read um, a blog series that we started called From Where I Stand, which is all of, is either local voices or a curated um, uh, articles or pieces or analysis of what the summa summative uh, experience of local voices uh, has to tell us about what kind of relationships uh, local actors want. So little detour there, but that is uh, part of this. In terms of reactions to uh, this list, and I apologize for joining late, um, I this is something maybe to pursue offline in terms of what does Sid 
um, like I'm a big believer in form following function and what is the SID chapter uniquely placed to provide as a service. Um, I'm also um, looking for innovation in terms of delivery about what kind of, rather than a speakers or a yet another panel discussion on a topic of import, how do we really deliver um, ongoing knowledge generation and creation? Um, and that's a broad topic. In terms of what you've said, laid out here in terms of topics, they're all good. They're all, they all bring a constituency. I have my um, own particular interest or what I think looking down the road, I think what Sid has the ability to do is um, um, see where the next set of issues are going to be. And you can, your list kind of reflects that as well. Um, but I would say uh, the what, I would consider the what and the how. Um, and I don't know if it's a book group on steroids or you know an expert panel or uh, what I've been experimenting with again in the CDA is that this group represents to me uh, a, a small group with a lot of um, with very little prep who are good thinkers can conceptualize very quickly in the in the in the space of an hour long Zoom call and everyone can walk away with two or three nuggets of great ideas. They can walk away with two or three contacts for continuing discussion or they can join two or three networks that they're not uh, already affiliated with. And to me, that are, are, is a set of uh, 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 the beginning of a value proposition for this group. Can I add to that, uh, Neil? Uh, I, when you talk about transferring out, um, over those last many years, I have been brought in in the waning months of the three, four, five year project uh, to be told, we need you to make our local partners self-sustaining. Uh, this needs to be part of the project design, not part of the exit strategy. And that's, you know, how these organizations become self-sustaining is never really uh, discussed in, until the project shutting down. And what I think we, we need to look at if uh, in terms of governance and, and passing these things along is how do we need to redesign projects from the get-go so that when they walk away, everything doesn't collapse? Uh, because if, this, if people will say, and I spent, I should point out that I spent a couple of years as the assistant director for the Center for Suicide Studies with John Thompson, uh, developing with, with a lot of the knowledge that, uh, that we have now about civil society. And we say, well, we're teaching these organizations to become civil society organizations. No, we're not. We're teaching them to become government subfunds. And we need to change how we work with them and, and what they need to become responsible for um, from the outset. Uh, uh, for you say people, what I've proposed to them is that in the proposal process, right now what we say is, okay, these are our local partners. And they say, oh, great. What they should be doing is saying, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Have each one of them submit to us a business plan explaining how they're going to continue doing all this after you leave. <laughs> uh, so I really think we need to, well, one of the conversations we need to have is who pays for this and how does it keep going when, we, when we're done? Otherwise, they will never be sustained. Great, Rick. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> Great, thanks, uh, Irving, Neil. Good points as always. Thank you, Rick, for that intervention. Appreciate it. Any final thoughts on other aspects of these two events we should consider? And layered on top of that, as important, uh, volunteers for helping Barbara and I put these together. So far, we have David, Lisa, Rolla, but would welcome others who we can be in touch with to help plan these two sessions. I'm so glad to support. Great, thanks, Andy. We're happy to support from our end as well. Great, thanks, Luke. I would have to look at what I can do and get back to you because I literally just rejoined again this morning. Yeah, no problem at all. <laughs> Take your time. 
Well, well, I have a great deal of experience with organizing these things, so I'll gladly uh, chip in there whenever I can. Perfect. Thanks, Rick. Well, it seems like we have a critical mass to help organize. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Uh, the two events. Any any final thoughts that folks want to share about other aspects we should be considering? You know, broader thoughts about the utility of this group and moving forward over the next twelve months. Yeah, just. Uh ask a question as a newbie Please. in terms of timetables. I mean, we have a lot, um, which is great. Um, so I'm just curious what next steps would be in terms of refining this. And, um, you know, obviously there's the, the platform, Neil, I think it was Neil, you brought up um, different avenues for dissemination and whatnot. And then of course the topically, you know, we have so much um, and you know, what, what, what the sequence would be roughly. Barbara, if you want to jump in, I can. Yes, I have some thoughts. But first, I see Andrea's hands up. So good when you go to him first. Yes, I also have a, a new big question, uh, which is uh, especially related to uh, voices from the field. Um, what is uh, this group capacity to work in other languages than English? Since I haven't never been in, in in a seed event before, is there a possibility for uh, simultaneous translation or do we need to think about people that speak English? That's a good question. I'm gonna toss that over to Paul to answer that specific one. Uh, Cause the last, so I think one thing I should mention is both Patrick and I are fairly new. Um, I became co-chair about six months ago and Patrick just joined a couple months ago, a little longer than six months ago. So we've, we've held one event and it was in English, but I think that's a really good point. Paul? Sorry, can you just, just to get, make sure I have that fully, fully understood, just to, re, just to repeat that again? So what is our capacity for, for example, what I, what I think I understand is, you know, if we wanted to bring in a voice from the field, someone who doesn't necessarily speak English. So um, yeah, do we thought. have capacity in house to do translation um, no, simultaneously? We don't, we, we're a really small team. Like you see that we, you know, we have, you know, there are three SID staff members on this call. That's three of, that's like half of this full-time staff. We just honestly don't have, um, we would like to, but unfortunately we just don't have the capacity. We are just so, we're already really stretched thin as it is. Um, so unfortunately we can't, I apologize. I would like to do so. I want to, I, I mean, that's the part of our goal. Our, our goal is to be as inclusive as possible and living up to that, to that mission statement. Um, it's just a matter of capacity at that point, And we just don't unfortunately have it. We're already stretched pretty thin as it is. Well, that being said, uh, if any of the members could, yes. uh, step forward and provide, if, if you're providing a speaker or a participant that doesn't speak English, if you can come up with a, a translator, well, that would be okay. <laughs> That's a great point, Rick, and Rule has already volunteered for Arabic, so, and I think, I think that is the great thing about our, you know, our membership is that we, I, I get the sense that folks are willing to pitch in, and I think we could definitely cover Arabic, Spanish, French, um, at least at minimum. Um, so I think if we have a, if we have someone identified, let's not let that um, be a showstopper um, at all. Um, we'll, we'll try to make it work. I think uh, speaking. Uh, um, so great. Um, uh, Barbara, unless people object, uh, is there any chance of you sending to everybody everybody else's email address so we can contact one another on some of these issues? I mean, so use my name. Yeah, Paul is again, go, I'm going to toss that back to Sid because he's the holder of the email list. Paul, has he left us? Oh, I apologize. I stepped away. I, I, stepped away. I, did run, I did go to the bathroom really quick. I missed that. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, Irving was asking about the email distro list and if, it's, if we share that for this no, group. No, we don't. For privacy reasons, we don't. Okay. No, I understand. But well, a number of people can, can like, I, like my, no. go ahead. Sorry. 
as an alternative, what I did with the civil society work group is I created a work group on LinkedIn and encouraged yeah. people to join. Yeah. And the conversation can take place there. So we, as Rick, as you're probably aware, we completely dissolved those because nobody, it, it depended on the work group and most of the work groups were not using them at all. It just kind of sat there and did absolutely nothing. Um, so we are currently working on trying to find another alternative to that solution to providing a forum in between events. Well, but until you find that alternative, this is what we have available now. Yes, but Sid W staff still needs to be monitoring it. Okay. Hey, Paul, at minimum, can you send me your email address so I can ask you for others in case I need it? Eric Rosenthal. Great. Um, and, and just to also mention, a number of people have put their emails in the, the chat to, I think, probably 50% at this point. And of course, you can always contact uh, me or Patrick. Um, we're always available for conversations or engagement. Um, I've already exchanged a couple emails about this particular session with a number of you. Uh, great. Uh, let's see. What else? Um, in terms of process, um, I think Patrick and I need to huddle and write something up. Um, and then, you know, with the, in particular with the Biden administration, you know, part of this is going to depend on timing. You know, um, if, if we want to hear from them um, about their plans, you know, we need to give them some time to get in, get in place, et cetera. So um, I think we'll, I, I would say, you know, and Derek, uh, you have a lot of experience with this. I think, you know, at minimum, it's going to take us three or four months to pull together the next event. So I, I would stay tuned. Um, you know, uh, we do send announcements out about the events uh, um, well in advance. Um, and I think that's really all I have at this point on planning. Derek, do you want to add anything else based on your experience? As a yeah, thanks, Barbara. I, I think one, one thing to recognize is when it's basically an all volunteer uh, effort. And so uh, planning takes a long time for these kinds of things. So in the past, we would sort of target, you know, one event in the spring and then one in the fall uh, for the for the two events and tended to avoid summer because a lot of people were uh, were traveling. Obviously, with COVID, that, that did not uh, interfere. And uh, so, for example, the, the event we did on TWP and political economy analysis was right there at the end of July, but people weren't going anyplace. So we'll have to see. I mean, I suspect if people get vaccinated, there may be an explosion of, of, uh, of travel over the summer as people are desperate to get out. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. But I would say, you know, just in terms of Patrick and Barbara, your own, your own planning. I'd sort of target something in, in the, in the May-June timeframe uh, and then kind of work backwards from that and, uh, and see what makes sense, whether it's either that first, uh, you know, the, the Biden topic or, or one of the others uh, in, in combination uh, and just see whichever one seems to make the most sense logistically in terms of pulling things off. Uh, the other thing uh, also is, if, if you're talking about bringing in voices from the field, that also adds another, uh, another layer of complexity. Uh, when we did the thing with the videos, uh, obviously there's a resource implication there and our partner, partner organizations, RTI being one of them, uh, we were able to find uh, internal resources to pay for doing that. Um, so it's one thing to say, oh yeah, well, we can always video stuff, but it, uh, it really does require uh, somebody ponying up some, some real money to, to do that kind of stuff. Um, so again, I mean, that isn't to say it can't happen, but it just needs to, to be recognized that there are, there are you know, both time and resource commitments involved in, in doing these things. Uh, it can definitely be worth it. I mean, that was, a, I think, a fantastic event. Um, and, uh, you know, so we'll just have to see where, where it goes. And uh, thanks to Barbara and Patrick for stepping up to being co-chairs. Uh, and uh, as always, to, to Paul for his terrific support over over the years in uh, in making these events uh, with Sid Washington uh, a big success. Can I add, uh, Derek, uh, with the Civil Society Work Group, as you do point out, this is an all volunteer organization. Uh, 
what we did was it, uh, we, if someone wanted to, you know, if we had numerous ideas, I asked the participants, okay, why don't you put together a, a one page concept paper? This is the topic, this, you know, this is the type of person or the people that I, I, I'd like to get involved and, and turn it over to the chairs and let the chairs say, well, what, what, you know, yeah, they're doable or, or pass it on the other and say, what do you think? Great, thank you, Rick. And thank you, Derek, for your kind words as well. Um, so a couple other things to note, you know, we do have uh, a number of volunteers. We will, I should also mention, we will of course be reaching out to you all um, directly. Thank you for volunteering. Um, and then the second thing to mention is in the chat, um, uh, Sid has posted uh, an e a general email address that you can uh, also reach out to and just to also uh, emphasize that the recording of the event and other resources will be on the website uh, as well. Um, so I just wanted to, to flag that. Patrick, did you have anything else? I see we're at time. So I do want to um, respect everyone's schedules and uh, finish on time if we can. Thanks, Patrick. And nothing else to add. Thanks again to everyone for taking the time. Really appreciate Barbara. it. Barbara and I'll be back in touch. Sure, Neil, yes, sir, Neil. Yeah, just, I, I, and I hate this has the feeling, I don't mean this to roll in a grenade in the 59th minute, but um, this, this group um, needs to be more diverse. Yes. No, I agree. I noted that as well. Um, so what are we going to do about that? Yeah, so as Derek mentioned, for for the last event we had, it was, that was, as Derek mentioned, I think I was a broken record on that. Um, and so we, we worked really hard to make sure that the panel and the participants, it, that it was a diverse a group in terms of that. In terms of membership, if you have any suggestions or anyone else has suggestions for reaching out, I will say, you know, for this, I was remiss in making sure that for this particular planning session, we we looked at that um, in terms of I think we the to be to be honest we received the participant list just yesterday so yeah, yeah, but no, I think no. that is that was a that was a um, failure on our part for this particular discussion um, but for the planning yeah. sessions we'll have more time yeah no I, I hear you and I, I think that in terms of events will be a consideration but I'm Absolutely. also thinking about the quality of our discussions if yes. we're we're very monochromatic and absolutely and heavily gendered and it's just it's for this field there's no real excuse for that and so what i would recommend is is uh, phone a friend um let's do some recruiting uh, and we also you know before you before you, before you joined we talked about a post survey um uh, related to the topic so that would be another way we can we can try to engage a broader yeah. audience as well but i love the phone of, i'm going to use that in my next meeting phone a yeah. friend and then <laughs> I think one other thing would be on, on the issue of diversity is to um, reach out to um, the disability community. Um, and uh, there's a lot of innovative work being done in that particular area. And so in thinking about constituencies, uh, let's just not overlook that. All right, sorry, for the, uh, sorry for arriving late and holding forth late. No, those are really important points. All right. Any alibis, any last? Uh... Right, I'll just chime in on that. We, Neil, just to address your concern, we have at least, well, you know, yes, we do recognize that we need to improve on that as a, as, um, as an organization. And, you know, we've created a, a, a task force on our board to figure out some of those things and how to, um, you know, look at what we're doing and kind of, you know, not auditing per se, but um, looking at what we're doing internally and figuring out how we can best address that, but also kind of do some of the things that we're doing uh, externally, external facing things that we do, uh, pieces of our programming. Yeah. Um, and then we're also reaching out to, uh, well, we also did just a few, like, I just, we just announced, well, we will announce it formally next week, but we, we also created a work group that will be around that space around race, ethnicity, and diversity, international development. So we did do that as well. Um, we also have been working with, trying to work with Gallaudet University on disability inclusion as well, trying to get um, uh, sign language interpreters at, at our events. We're trying to make, make that work and 
um, it's just kind of a fun, uh, like just working it out with them. So we're trying to, we are, we have been working on those things, particularly we did an event on disability inclusion last, last April and have been working on, on that issue ever since. Can I add one of the things that uh, when we were organizing civil society work groups and it was a big push a few years ago uh, to look for co-sponsorship. So look at some of the other committees, uh, some of the other work groups. Yes, we look talked at about the that. Women yeah. and the, the, the gender group, look at the health group, look at the and bring them in and approach them and say, let's work together on this. Yes, Thank Rick. you. We had a great discussion about that earlier as well. Um, and thanks to Rula for help uh, offering to help us on the persons with disabilities issue. Um, Rula will be reaching out to you um, on that. Any, um, anything else before we, thank you just, all again. Was, oh, thank you Rula, go ahead. Yeah, just a final comment. This is the first time that I actually joined a, a working group. I'm, I've been a member of, of SID through my through my company for a long time. But I I, I think one of the things is that it, um, it wasn't clear to me how often the working group met. And sometimes people respond better if there is a set time on their calendar um, than having to every time register for a meeting, just in terms of, of feedback. Um, Another thing that I wanted to say is I got a lot of emails from Sid when when it's the conference or the annual dinner or the career fair, um, but perhaps there's not that level of outreach perhaps for the working groups. It's kind of buried in the newsletter and you have to look for it and then go to the website and then register and then get a link. And, and the, the calendar invite that you download does not have the link, which is I think maybe why some of the people were late it was sent separately. Um, so maybe it's just the technology little fixes here and there that could that could help. And I will be phoning some friends, so no worries. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you again, uh, Patrick. Any last words? No, that's all. I'm being called to dad duty here. Thanks all. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Great to Bye. see you.